Hey guys, this video is sponsored by Ibble. Make sure you guys download the app, follow me, and talk to me on there. Hey guys, welcome back to The Blair White Project. Today's guest, you guys are going to go crazy for, rapper, songwriter, former pro wrestler, just learned that actually, my friend Tom McDonald. How are you, Tom? <laughs> good, how are you? I'm very good. So excited you're here. So it's been about the one-year anniversary of Snowflakes. Do you look back on that video or that music video as fondly as I do? Because it's like the coolest thing in the world to me still. I still talk about it. Dude, yeah, I mean that was such a wild ride to uh like fake woke just exploded and was like on fox news and was like this huge thing and then we were like yo like how can we follow that up and like do something even crazier uh and then we did snowflakes and like to me that's like still like that's one of the pinnacles of of, of anything we've ever done um and just to have you be a part of it like obviously nova and i are are big supporters and big fans of you so like yeah, I look I look back on it just as fondly as you do. Yeah, it's still to this day. I feel like it's one of those things that I'm going to get to look back on when I'm old. And be like, remember when I was in my 20s and did a music <laughs> video? Because not for nothing, I'm sure you could tell, like, I'm not the kind of person people call to be in music videos. <laughs> so it was kind of a once in a lifetime thing. So super cool for me. Um, what people don't know about you, or maybe they do, I don't know, actually, is that you guys are super independent. You have like a really small ship over there. You do everything yourselves. Um, yeah. Can you speak to just the work ethic it takes? Because I think we filmed the Snowflakes video on a Friday and I'm pretty sure you guys put it out on Monday, which I can barely do with regular YouTube videos. Yeah, we I think we actually shot it Wednesday, edited Thursday, dropped it Friday. Oh, so, okay, not, but still. So yeah, but, but like one day. So, yeah, it's pretty it's I mean, it's for, you know, you do you do all your stuff yourself as well. Like it's uh, it's a grind, man, like um, it's really like I just saw it's funny that you say this because I, I was just talking to Nova yesterday, like some like uh, conspiracy, like Instagram page, like posted uh, me and Nova the other day saying that we we're like these like Illuminati industry plants and like all this weird stuff. And like the part that irritates me the most about it is that like I'm working 20 hours a day to get everything that we need to get done done from like making the beats to writing the songs to designing the t-shirts to pre-production post-production like literally every facet of my career that you could possibly imagine um and i've got i put nova to work too like nova's working 20 hours a day too easy um wow so then i see these things that are like uh Yo, know, they're an industry plan from the Illuminati. And I'm just like, yo, I wish I was the industry plan for the Illuminati because <laughs> then I wouldn't have to work 20 hours a day uh, and invest all my own time, energy, and money into this stuff. So it's, uh, but you know what? I wouldn't want it any other way. I have so many friends that are signed to like major labels and I see the, the, the creative positions they're put in and I see the financial positions they're put in and I just see, uh, that music and the art, their art becomes work to them. Yeah. And like, it, it's, I feel like this word is like super over overused, but I feel super blessed um, to be able to do what I love and to be able to put 20 hours into doing something that I love every day. Like it's fucking awesome. So. Yeah. And just the fact that you're reaching so many people, I mean, you mentioned the Illuminati thing, which is so funny because you do have the kind of views and audience that any artist would sell their soul to the devil for, literally. Like, <laughs> I mean, you ha how many number one hits have you had on Billboard? Uh, I think we're at like 25 or 26. But that's insane. It's pretty like, wild. Did you ever expect your life to be like, that's like, you can't even fathom that. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> long ago that like, I had pretty much submitted to the fact like it's pretty well documented that I went through like a bunch of like addiction stuff and, and mental health problems and uh, some pretty gnarly stuff like four or five years back. And at that point in time, I had pretty much submitted to the fact that like that was pretty much it. Like I had wanted to, you know, be a musician or be a famous rapper or whatever the case may be like my entire life. And then when, when that whole thing happened, I was just kind of like, well, I better get comfortable kind of like um, coming to terms with the fact that I'm not, I'm not going to sort of like accomplish those dreams and stuff and just sort of wow. um, 
you know, come uh, just sort of accept that so I could find some sort of like serenity in my life. Um, so yeah, there was a point where I was just kind of like, I guess that's it. It is what it is. And then, uh, it's weird, man. It was like, um, it's just, just meant to be thing. Like I've told the story a few times, but Nova and I were like, I had just recovered from, I was sober. I had just recovered from this mental breakdown. I had just moved out to the States. I was living with Nova, like in the hood in this really rundown shack and like, there was like mice and rats like in the house and like cockroaches in our cupboards. And like the one thing that always sticks out to me was our power would always get cut off because we couldn't, we couldn't always afford to pay the rent and the bills. And this one time our, our electricity got cut off and we, we were without power for like three days because we, we didn't have like the $60 or whatever it was to pay the electrical bill. And I had to plug my fridge into an extension cord and run it out the back window of my house and plug it into my neighbor's garage so our food didn't spoil um and uh can you hold on one second i think the camera switched are we good you guys his camera like switched for a second we good okay sorry i had like it's okay i had like a a spam call come in or something um so yeah i had i'd run that cord out the back window and plugged it into my neighbor's my neighbor's garage so our food didn't spoil and uh it was like it was grim and then one day I, I, it's like literally like almost out of like a book or something. I had this pack of cigarettes and I had like a half of a cigarette left and I went and sat on the front porch and smoked this half a cigarette. And while I was smoking that cigarette, I was writing that I had just been listening to like Drake or like G easy or like some sort of like emotional rap and, and whoever it was, was like a huge superstar. And they were sort of complaining about like, what their life was like and dealing with fame and like, and this type of thing. And I felt really irritated by it um, because here I am with no power and um, you know, Nova and I struggling and Nova having problems with her asthma and having to stay in the hospital for four days that cost us $30,000 that we didn't have. And we're starting GoFundMe's and plugging our fridge into our neighbor's house. And I was just really irritated hearing somebody that had so much that had hearing somebody that had the life that I wanted complain about it. And I went and sat on the front porch and smoked that half a cigarette. And I started writing this sort of like open letter to these superstar rappers. And by the time I was done smoking that cigarette, I had written dear rappers. And I remember like running into the house and I was like hyperventilating. I said, Nova, I just, I just wrote the song. It's going to change our life. I swear to God, I just did it. Wow. Get your, get your camera. We've got to shoot this video. She's like, you haven't even recorded it yet. So I'm going to go sit down and record it right now. Like while I'm recording the song, can you pull the back? I got literally goosebumps, right? Just talking about it. I was like, can you pull the backdrop down and set up the camera while I record this song? Wow. And she was like, yeah, okay. So I went and recorded. She set up the backdrop. I came back, we shot the video. Uh, we edited it that night. Um, the next day, I called my best friend, Brandon Hart, who's an incredible musician, my sister, uh, my mom, and uh, another friend of mine at the time. And I borrowed like two or $300 from each person. And I think what I had, the total pool was like 1100 bucks. And I took that 1100 bucks and put it on a Facebook ad to boost the Dear Rappers video. And two days later, it had over a million views and we were just, and it was over. Like Wow, that quick. It's crazy. That's a movie. That's a, that's a it's, whole movie. It's a movie. It was like, like, I don't, I don't know, man. God was just like looking down on me that day. And he was just like, you know what? Like, this is your time. You've, you've learned enough about yourself and you've screwed up enough times now. Like I'm going to throw you a bone. And then we just took it and fucking ran with it. And here we are. Wow. So you've just carried it on since that first Facebook ad that produced that like amazing result. I didn't know it could produce that crazy results. I mean, obviously the talent's coming into play too. You're awesome at what you do, but that's so insane. It, it was different back then too. Like oh. the way that the way that Facebook and those platforms were operating back then, like I don't think we realized it at the time, but that was like the wild west. If, if you had like a, 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 a song that sounded good and you put some like captions on it, like 
oh my God, I can't believe this rapper said this. Like you have to hear it, fire or trash. Like, you know, and you just put that out and put 500 bucks on it. It would, it was gone. Wow. But the way, the, the way that Facebook and I mean, all the platforms now, like they're, they're so heavily like involved in censorship and suppression of free speech and stuff. Like uh, I feel like we just snuck in through that door before they slammed it closed, you know? So it was just yeah. a lot, a lot of it was timing and luck. Yeah. So then the question becomes, you said earlier that when you were listening to rappers, you know, talk about hating their lives despite being so successful and not having to worry about their food perishing and everything you mentioned. <laughs> um, so now that you're on the other side of that, where obviously you're making great money, you're very famous, you're very successful. Um, do you look at that differently now? Do you think that that is something that has brought you happiness? Is that kind of the old age question of like, does money bring happiness? I mean, I, I definitely like, I definitely understand now, uh, like sort of where some of that stuff came from. I am like extremely, extremely grateful and thankful for um, everything that we've accomplished and um, done with my career and stuff. But, you know, I, I started out with like really acute, um anxiety and really acute depression and some really prolonged periods of like mental unwellness and like i don't think that there's any amount of recognition success fame uh, money respect from your peers admiration i don't think there's any amount of anything uh that ever makes that stuff feel any better because i know that i still have uh days where i'm not feeling well and um you know i i lay in bed and just like question like what is any of this what's it good for if if i don't feel well enough to enjoy any of this any of the stuff like the the house that i bought for the first time in my life or the pool or the nice clothes or whatever the case may be whatever these you know trappings of life that you sort of accumulate along the way if you don't feel well enough to um enjoy any of that stuff well i mean you know yeah what what's it good for so it really boils down to um i think that the only what i'm truly after in life is um same thing everybody else is after just happiness tranquility some some sort some sense of calm and um that's i think that's sort of the primary function of my music at this point i think there's a lot of people that um with their art, they want to like accumulate more and more and more. They want more money, more fame, more recognition, more success, more, more, more. And to me, like my main focus is I want less of things. I want less anxiety. I want less depression. I want less unwellness. Um, and I want happiness. So I think the primary function of what I'm trying to do is I make music that makes me feel better, that allows me to express myself. And I feel better for making the music and putting it out into the world. Um, and it's hopefully it tends to find the people who need it most and it helps those people feel better when they hear it. And then they come to me and say, Hey man, you know, I was, I've been listening to your music for the last six months while I've been going through chemo or my mom passed away and I just listened to your music for two weeks and that's what got, brought me through it. And th hearing things like that, it's like, I did it so I could feel good. I put it out into the world and it made you feel good. You came back to me and told me that it helped you, which makes me feel good again. Right. So it's just this like continuous reciprocation of uh music being a universal antidote to like a lot of the poisons in life and i think that's just sort of what i'm trying to do now you know yeah and your audience i know this having been your video and obviously like you know them following me and interacting with me um every interview i do doesn't matter if there's like a q a at the end or a live stream on someone's channel or a podcast i will get at least one question about being in the video like your audience is very dedicated you've definitely touched them in like a really really big way and that's what's so interesting right is that you've obviously won over the people like you do crazy numbers have a dedicated audience but then the music industry itself is so gatekeepy um in a world that made any sense with someone who's had as many hits as you've had and as many success and eyes on you you'd be at the Grammys, you'd be at the Oscars, you'd be doing all these things. Is it frustrating that you are to an extent kept out of that, obviously because of the content of your music and it's, it's political, some of the songs, or is that a club that you'd rather not be a part of anyways? Um, I think that like, 
anybody who says that they're not interested in winning a Grammy or they're not interested in sitting at the Oscars or they're not interested in uh, being recognized at the highest level by the industry, anybody who says they're not interested in, I would have to say that there, there's probably a little bit of bullshit in that. Yeah. Um, because like, obviously those things would be great. Um, and for a long time, like I really wanted to, you know, get a Grammy and, and be at the Billboard Music Awards and do all that stuff. Um, but sort of like what I'm starting to realize is that was sort of my mistake because I've spent so long um, creating an ecosystem outside of the music industry um, and staying so self-contained in that ecosystem and taking shots at and attacking and criticizing the status quo that have been defined by that music industry that like wanting to then be validated by that group of people is sort of like counterproductive to like what I'm trying to do. Right. And I've just started realizing that recently, like I've wanted to get the Grammy and go to the award shows and do that stuff, but it just feels so much more um, valuable um, to surpass what the music industry is doing. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't need like, a gold record from RCA AA certified. Like I know how many albums I've sold. I can look at my store. I, I know I've sold uh, whatever it is, 320,000 albums. I can go get my own gold record without it having the RC AA stamp on it. And I can hang it on my own wall. Like, I don't need your Grammy. I don't need your awards. I don't need your chart positions. I, I know where I'm at. So I, I'm, I'm sort of like coming to terms with the fact that like, um, I've been throwing rocks at that glass house for like forever. Mm. So like, why are they at, why would they ever give me a pat on the back and why would I want it? You know? Exactly. And it's, it's the fact that you criticize the system and then also just, you know, some of your biggest songs are so political. And obviously when it comes to politics and music industry, there is only one side that you can be on that allows upward mobility in that sense. But I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's cooler that you operate outside that system. I think you have, completely your own lane um i mean just the fact that you're a white rapper is obviously putting you aside and then the fact that you make political music videos and then on the right you're in your own lane and i think you're all the better for it i wouldn't change that at all um yeah how nerve-wracking is the tightrope you probably not even probably you definitely have to walk this tightrope between <laughs> saying what you want need or feel compelled to say in your music and not being censored and banned. Because I've seen a lot of things like, um, you know, when you drop a new song, you're actively encouraging your fans to do every single thing they can to kind of circumvent the roadblocks that are put there. Um, right. So how hard is that to deal with? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's like the weirdest thing. Like, um, I don't know, like, if you recall, but like a couple months ago, um, I did a project with Adam Calhoun. And the first music video we released was called New World Order. Yeah. And um, like it got like fact checked on YouTube uh, by like Wikipedia or something. So there was like a Wikipedia like blurb on the video that said that like New World Order is a conspiracy theory uh, about a, a secretly emerging totalitarian government and like and all this stuff, which I don't even really think we talked about in the song. But um, how do they fact check a music video? Do they fact check a Katy Perry music video like E.T. and be like, right? she's not really an alien and then using Wikipedia exactly. as the fact check? Yeah. And like. Who like. If Wikipedia is the least reliable source of information on the Internet, you like, can't even use so, it in college. You cannot cite Wikipedia in college. Yeah. So it, it was it was crazy. And then like. The, the thing that really got me was like, we were trending at number six. Um, if you went to our music video, it said you're trending, it said number six trending video or whatever. And then when you went to the trending charts on YouTube, it, it skipped from five to seven. Like six wasn't even on the trending charts. They just like completely removed it, oh my God. Uh, which, which was like super weird. Um, so like, 
yeah, having to take, you know, certain measures to try to avoid things like that. Like, it's a pain in the ass because, like, sometimes I really want to say uh, there's a lot of things that have been sort of heavily uh, censored from the Internet, especially in these last two years. Um, and, like, you can't be blatant about your thoughts and feelings about them because they'll just remove your content. And for me, it's like, I've been trying to get to where I'm at right now for 12 or 13 years. And I almost lost it along the way to alcohol and mental health stuff. So it's like a very dicey thing for me to be like, okay, I really want to say this, but I know if I say this, as blatantly and as bluntly as I want to say it, it's going to cause me, it's going to cause me problems, which then presents me with the challenge of uh, how can I sort of creatively allude to the fact like, Hey, read between the lines here. I'm saying something here, if you're paying attention and trying to get those types of things underneath the radar. So that's sort of, that's the tightrope that I, that I've been walking. Right. I guess in some ways it could be, like in a roundabout kind of way easier if you're doing music because you can sort of make analogies and you can like artfully say things. Whereas, I don't know, if you just had Twitter to use, you're probably going to just say it flat out and then you get banned. So I guess in some ways it's good. Um, it's it's kind of fun because I feel like I'm like, I feel like I'm s- all the things that they don't want you to say that, that they'll delete you or ban you or censor you or shadow ban you or deplatform you all those things i feel like i'm sneaking them through under the radar and i get a lot of satisfaction from that so yeah that's amazing do you ever feel uh pigeon held into doing political music because obviously that's not all you do um you have so much other great music that doesn't have any political undertones or overtones um, do you ever feel like a pressure to make that stuff to appease? Obviously, you built a huge fan base on songs like Fake Woke, Snowflake, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like a little bit. But the thing is, is like that the songs like that are a big part of like who I am. And I, I love making those songs. I love talking about those topics with my friends. I love, you know, uh, coming up with, with creative concepts to take those messages and put them in music form. Like that's a big part of who I am. I I really love doing that stuff. The, I think, I guess the problem is it's not, even though it's a big part of who I am, it's not the only part of who I am. There's like a lot of other, pardon me, types of music that I want to make. Like, um, like bad news that I did with mad child and Nova. That's like a pop song. Mm -hmm. And, um, I love music like that. Um, and I love the, the songs about mental health and I love the songs about addiction and I love the songs that even aren't about anything in particular. It's just like, I want to make music today and I don't want to make music with a message and I just want to make music. Um, so it's like super important to me to, um, sort of put those other parts of myself like on display and, and release them. And it, you know, sometimes it's frustrating. Like, um, I just released scars um uh 11 days ago and um scars is just sort of about like the battle wounds and stuff that we all get going through life and you you get them from all types of different things physical wounds from accidents and surgeries to mental wounds from traumas and, and 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 stuff like that so that whole song is just about overcoming our past and living in the present and being hopeful moving into the future And the song meant a lot to me and I thought it was really good. And it was like, sort of like a, um, like a country pop song. There's also some like auto tune rap in it. Like it was just this merger of like all these different styles. Yeah. I'm so proud. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I I mean, it it was awesome that you were displaying being able to play the guitar. I didn't know you could play the guitar. Well, not very well. I I can, I can play it on stage, but if you give me a studio and I can do like 30 or 40 takes, I can figure it out. Um, It worked. Thank you. Yeah. So, putting stuff like that out, like I, I'm so proud of it. And, and I want people to love it so badly. So it's like sitting at like 2.7 million views right now, which is nothing to like turn your nose which up. Which is at. Like insane I'm, still. Yeah. I'm super grateful for, for all of those 2.7 million views. But if that song was the system or fake woke or no lives matter or snowflakes or America or clown world, or the list goes on, 
like that would be sitting at like probably seven or eight million views right now. So it is like a little bit like disheartening when you're like, oh man, like, right. I feel like I, I pour my heart out and like showing different sides of me and people are like, oh yeah, that's cool. But like, when's the next fake woke come out? And you're just like, oh man. Right. I want to make the next fake woke, but I don't want to feel like I'm being pressured into making the next fake woke, you know? That's right. I mean, I relate to that even just on a content creation level. It's like, obviously, people want to hear about the trans shit for me more than anything else. And it gets so old because my real life is like, not super concerned with it. Uh, but but yeah, you got to give them what they want and then and then show other sides of you. But it's so cool that you still have such a huge audience for those songs that aren't political. And then not for nothing, the political songs are really, really important. I think that we're living in a time where the fact that you've become so massively successful, it's because you're speaking things that people feel like they cannot and not even just feel like they can't. They know they can't. They will lose their jobs. They will, you know, be outcast in certain uh, circles. So I think the biggest thing is like you're giving people a voice that don't have a voice at all. So I think you should be proud of it. Absolutely. I I am. I mean, and, and uh, I mean, that's, you know, a lot of people think that like a lot of my political stuff is, is, is just, is all about just like shock factor and, and causing controversy and I don't get creating that from a, it at all. I'm, yeah. I mean, all of those things are great, but like, I feel like the primary goal is to, empower people who otherwise wouldn't ever have a, like a dog in the fight. They just feel like they're just like sitting around with all of these thoughts and feelings and opinions that they're not allowed to have. And like, that's gotta be frustrating. Like, so I, I just feel like I've always been bullied in elementary school, a loner in high school, uh, you know, struggled in, in, in life, um, just being sort of like a weird kid. Um, and I've always just, I'm all about the underdog. And I feel like these days, the underdogs are people on the right side of the spectrum. I really believe that I feel like they're constantly ridiculed and beat down by the left wing media. And, and, and I don't even think that like all the people on the left side of the spectrum are bad. Like, I think yeah. that a lot of them have like, good ideas and a lot of them are just totally regular people. But I do feel like um, people on the right side of the spectrum are bullied by a large portion of the rest of the world. And I just feel like songs like fake woke and snowflakes and stuff like that. It's kind of just like a big, like, fuck you yeah, to, to the people that are like, bullying the underdog so and it's really important for me to stand with those people so 100 percent um and so i wanted to ask you this the world of white rappers i feel like is so small is there like have you been <laughs> have you been in contact with people like g easy eminem i know there was like a thing with eminem we don't have to go into all that but like do you guys all know each other or is it kind of like you guys avoid each other what is that like i mean i think Asking me, you're probably not going to get a super, uh, I think my situation is like a, a little unique because I don't think these days it's like any time uh, an uh, 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 independent rapper gets a DM from like a famous rapper or something, like what's the first thing they do? They fucking screenshot mm -hmm. it. And, and put it on their Instagram, put it on their Facebook. And they're like, oh, look who sent me a message, blah, blah, blah. There's a right. huge fucking cl clout chasing culture. And uh, so for that reason, like, I think a lot of these guys, like, um, I don't really know any of them really, because I think that they look at me as sort of like a liability. They're like, oh shit, like, um, like, especially when we talk about guys like g -Eazy, Eminem, um, you know, guys of that caliber who are, involved in the mainstream music industry and they have labels and, and brand sponsorships and endorsements mm -hmm. and and like you know uh buildings full of people you know working on, on on branding and marketing and and that type of thing it's like i don't think a lot of them really want to be associated with somebody like me i think they look at me as it's that's dangerous uh, there's a lot of people out there who think that that guy, that guy's a racist, that guy is homophobic, right. that guy's transphobic, he's sexist, he's a some raging Republican rapper guy. Um, and if 
he posts a message that you guys are talking back and forth or you do a song with him or you co-sign him, that's going to reflect negatively on your career. So I think that, I think that there's a lot of people, not just in music, but in entertainment that I think a lot of them um, are a little more conservative or a little more right leaning yes. than they might let, let on publicly. Cause they're all and rich. I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everybody keeps that like very close to the chest because they don't want to do anything to, to, to damage what they've got going on. So, um, so yeah, no, no, I don't know any of them. <laughs> but you know what? That speaks to the fact that what I mentioned earlier, you being in your own lane, you are also, I would say pretty much a hundred percent uncancelable. I mean, you're not subject to the same like whims of the public that these traditional artists are because I mean we've seen what happens what happens when other artists have like stepped a little bit over the line and maybe been perceived a little bit of right of center slightly ever so slightly it's like they can have their lives torn apart so you're completely immune to that which is why I think it's so much better you're in your lane as well like just totally totally I don't even think it's that like when when people see a musician uh get canceled um, I think that people are like under the impression that like, it's the woke mob on the internet that canceled that artist, but it wasn't really, um, in order to be canceled, you have to submit to that fact. Yes. Um, like the, the, the greatest way to like, to not get canceled is there's a bunch of people trying to cancel you and you just say, uh, no, the fuck I'm not. And then you continue on with your life and that's that's it. But what's actually happening is it's not the woke mob on the internet canceling these artists. It's the woke mob on the internet claiming we're canceling this guy, we're canceling this guy. And then it's the people at the record label right. that work in marketing, that work in management, that work in PR, that, that your agents, it's all of the people that work in the record label and they're saying, Oh, we don't want to be associated with this artist who's got such a negative public image right now. So we're going to cancel him and they, they drop him and they drop him off the label and they fire him and they remove his team from him, his or her team, whatever the case may be. So it's that it's it's corporations yeah. and big entities, businesses um, that are crumbling under public pressure and canceling and canceling artists and canceling entertainers. So, and then it makes them you know, feel like they won, like they did it because in a sense that they did. And I always think, because I've had um, obviously dealt with brands being a YouTuber and uh, doing sponsorships and stuff like that. And um, I always make sure I'm communicate to them very clearly. Like you are working with someone who is seen as controversial. You will likely get angry emails for appearing in my videos. You will likely get angry tweets. And I'm only interested in working with brands that are willing to withstand that. Because you have mm -hmm. to remember a lot of these brands, like they they have someone working their social media and who's really tweeting, I don't know, like Kellogg's all day. They don't get a lot of engagement on these brands. A lot of their numbers are, you know, inflated. So all they're seeing on the timeline is like F you for working with Tom McDonald or Blair White or whoever. And so you they don't really understand social media that that is so fleeting and it'll be over in two minutes and then they're dropping someone and then it's a scandal. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So, so yeah, it's like, uh, you know, it's, I, I encourage, you know, whether it's a YouTube personality or a musician or, um, you know, what there's a billion different types of artists today. Um, I, I would just encourage everybody to, to, to go at it alone. And uh, yes, today and with the tools that we have available to us, social media and just our phones and computers and just everything that we have access to, like, having a manager, having a PR team, having a marketing department, having like, it's completely unnecessary. And um, in the short term, like maybe you think like, oh, this is great. Like there's all these people trying to help me. But in the long term, like those people are gonna become your worst enemy and they'll control every aspect of your career and the rest of your life. And whether that's cancel you or dictating what direction your art's gonna go in or whatever. Um, so I would just, you know, encourage everybody ind independent, artistry is you get to keep every penny for yourself mm -hmm. you get to maintain your artistic integrity and freedom every step along the way it's this period of the entertainment industry is like literally the revenge of the artist if you choose to make it that way yes and you're proof that it can be done that you can do it entirely yourself um 
Although I did want to talk to you about Nova because Nova is a huge help with you. Um, she was, when I was doing the Snowflake thing, a lot of people don't know that you weren't actually in studio. I was being produced by you guys basically over FaceTime. Uh, but yeah. she's super involved in all your videos and production. Um, and she makes her own music, which is also amazing. How do you guys kind of navigate being able to obviously have a great relationship? You guys seem very happy, but also intertwine business in such a really intense way. Cause that's easier said than done. Not for nothing. It's uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult. Like, I don't know if who I am these days, I'm so focused on the music stuff and uh, my career. Like, I don't know if, any other relationship uh, would work for me. Like Nova has been so, uh, so uh, such an integral part of everything. She's so selfless in that, like, if I'm like, Hey, I have 35 things that I need to get done uh, in the next two days. And I physically do not have enough hours in the day to like get all this stuff done. I just don't, even if I work from right now, 24 hours around the clock for the next two days, like I'm not going to have enough time. Um, Nova's right there, uh, working 20 hour days with me, sharing the workload that it's not even her work to do. And she does it because she believes in what I'm doing and she believes in the vision and she doesn't even always believe in all of the things that I say in my music, but still, um, stands next to me and helps yeah. conceptualize the videos and shoots the videos and edits the videos and helps me release them. And, it's just uh, we've become sort of so intertwined at this point in time. We're like it's we're almost like one entity sometimes. Um, and I can attest so to that because there've been times where I've had to text you or I wanted to ask you something or whatever, and I'll get a reply back saying Tom's super busy right now. Uh, I'll give the message, and it's Nova. <laughs> so yeah, you guys kind of are one entity. Whenever I text yeah. you, I don't know who I'm going to get because you guys are you know doing everything together. Yeah. So. Yeah, she's just been the, um, just like, if, uh, you know, like I said, when I when I wrote that Dear Rapper song and I was like, oh my God, I had that aha moment. And I was like, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. Like, if it wasn't for Nova, um, it might've been, it might've been one and done. It might've been Dear Rappers came out and that might've been the end of, uh, uh, of me. Um, or it might have taken me, you know, five times as long to get where I'm at now. Because, uh, you know, right after Dear Rappers, I was like, I felt like I had just unlocked in my in my consciousness, what I was supposed to be doing and the type of music I was supposed to be making and who I was supposed to be talking to. And uh, it, it was an incredibly difficult ride to keep up with incredibly difficult. Like we went Dear Rappers, hell of it politically incorrect white boy straight white male everybody hates me like and it was just one after another boom 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 and like no one person is physically capable of doing that um so she's just been a total total blessing she's i am i i'm not the best rapper in the world i'm not the best producer in the world i'm not really the best at anything but I will outwork everybody in the room every single time. I have yeah. a disgusting, disgusting work ethic. You do. And thank you. And I've never met anybody um, that is willing to go to the lengths that I will to get the job done until I met Nova. She is like, she's literally willing to go there with me every single time. Um, wow. And it's just, it's just been, I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful and thankful for Nova. And it's, it's not, it's not easy. Like, um, you know, sometimes it's like we're working on projects for, you know, two weeks straight. And I don't think we've said a single word to each other that wasn't about work. Wow. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, like, have we played video games together in two weeks? Have we sat down and watched a movie together in two weeks? Have we eaten dinner together in two weeks? Have we gone for a walk in two weeks? Have we done anything with one another that hasn't been, uh, you know, work centric? So it's like a super difficult thing to juggle. But uh, I, again, like Nova is a very, very, very understanding and selfless person. And I don't think it would work with anybody else. So I'm just very thankful.
Yeah, and it's all the more cool that she was there before any of this happened for you. So the fact that she was able to also like meet the rise of everything you've had going on too and just grow with you is so cool. Um, so it's I wanted crazy. to ask you, you recently raised, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, $71,000 for veterans. And I saw yeah. your post about it. So tell me about that and what inspired you to do that and what you're hoping is done with the money. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to like, I've, uh, I came to the States like eight years ago. Um, I traveled kind of around the world twice prior to that. And I always, um, I never felt at home um, back in Canada. And I always thought that like, I just wanted to find a place that felt like home. And when I find that place, I'm going to settle down and that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. And I went to Europe and a, a few times and I always thought that like, Oh, maybe London will feel like home or Paris will feel like home, Amsterdam or, or Athens or, you know, Barcelona or like one of these places. And, uh, I went to all of them and they were all great. And there's nothing felt like home. And then I came to the States and it was like, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was at home. I don't know why. Um, I just felt like this is where I want to be for, this is where I want to be for the rest of my life. Like I, I, I feel like, um, the United States is the greatest country in the world. Um, period. I don't think that there's any, there's no discussion there. So, and, and it sounds kind of crazy, but I think a lot of people, when they sort of picture like, um, the American dream, they sort of like picture this, like disheveled family, like arriving on the shores of America on like a little wooden raft, like all dirty and like, come to like make a life in America. And, um, it doesn't always look like that. I came here, uh, fresh off a of mental breakdown, fresh off of addiction problems. Uh, my dad dropped me off at the airport and gave me $800. He put $800 in my grandfather's old wallet and gave me my grandfather's wallet with 800 bucks in it. And he said, uh, this is all, this is all I got. I, I can't give you any more than this. this is all I got. Um, you got one job when you go to America uh, live up to your potential. And I came here and I just feel like this country and maybe more importantly, the people in this country, um, gave me everything I ever wanted. Um, in terms of my, Hey, in terms of my career and music and, um, and my relationship and, um, it just, it just gave me this is the American dream. Yeah. It just is. I came here with nothing and I ended up with everything and I'm so thankful and so grateful for it. And I'm constantly trying to figure out ways that I can give back and um, really put my money where my mouth is, no pun intended, and, um, and just contribute back into this country for what it's given me. And I think I'm a firm believer um, that the only reason that this country is as great as it is, is because there was people that were brave enough to fight for it. Um, so I just thought that uh, that's where I wanted to contribute. So um, Adam and I did this album called The Brave. And we had a we had a, a limited number of CDs. And some of them were gold foil covers, and some of them were silver foil co co covers. And a box of the gold foil albums went missing in the mail. And it was gone for like four weeks. We kept track checking the tracking numbers and it was like it disappeared in Florida. And then it like randomly appeared like somewhere way up north in California. And then it disappeared again. And then just randomly one day, this beat up, fucked up box just showed up on my sister's doorstep. And she was like, hey, like, I got this weird box that came to my house. It's got your name on it. I was like, fuck, cut it open and tell me what's in it. And she was like, holy shit, it's the fucking brave albums, the gold oh, ones wow. that went mi missing a month ago. And I was like, Oh fuck. Like, what are we going to do with this? Because we told people once they're sold out, they're gone forever. Um, how am I supposed to now come back and be like, Oh, found this box of albums. People are going to be like, bullshit. Like right. you're just trying, you're just trying to sell this last box and make a bag or whatever. Yeah. So I just, I just said to 
you know, I sat down with Nova and I was like, look, I've, I've been wanting to like give back um, um, in a cool way. So what if we take the box of albums and we just donate every single dollar to like a, a, a military charity of some sort? And she was like, yeah, that's cool. So I, there was like a, I don't know. Uh, it was like, it was one box of albums. So, you know, selling those albums for 15 bucks a piece you're not going to like have any significant amount of money to donate. So I was like, make the albums a hundred dollars each. There's people on eBay selling them for 500 bucks. So fuck it, make mm-hmm. the albums a hundred bucks each. And we'll also sell these uh, hangover gang supports our veteran shirts. And we'll just make as much money as we can. And we'll just give it all to a charity. And when it was all said and done, uh, there was almost $72,000 there. And then, um, I spent like three weeks researching different charities, military charities and family of, uh, of fallen soldiers. And I eventually, like after three weeks of trying to figure this out, I found U.S. vets and they have stations all over America and they help like 20,000, over 20,000 vets a year with housing, employment uh, and mental health stuff. So it's primarily functioning as um they get homeless veterans off the street because i used to say to nova every all the time we'd like stop at a red light and there'd be a guy with a cardboard sign and that says he's a u.s veteran and he's homeless and he's struggling and i I used to say to nova constantly like these guys are fucking heroes real life heroes and they come back here and they're fucking homeless and like I like literally got tears in my eyes right now. It's so like, it's, wrong. it's a fucking shame. Like the, the most, the, like, yeah, the, the, the sort of most forward thinking, um, amazing country in the world. Uh, it still has its problems and it should be fucking ashamed of that. So, um, it was just really important to, um, you know, even if there's fucking five less guys next year, standing on the street holding those signs to me i just look at that as a win so i just hope that, that seventy thousand, you know i did i did all of my due diligence i looked into how they spend their money i looked at, at all of their taxes i looked at everything to make sure that the highest percentage of every dollar was actually going to their programs and i think out of like every dollar like 90 cents was going to their the programs of oh, this charity great. so so that's where we we sent the money and uh it's the first charity I've ever done in my life. And I think I'm going to make it like an annual thing and do it once a year because um, I've had my moments where I was really happy about a number one on the charts or I was really happy about a fucking million views or whatever the case may be. But I don't think I've ever felt as good as I felt um, when I called that charity and I said, hey, I want to make a donation. Can you guys send me your wiring info? And then sending them $72,000 was just like oh, the wow. greatest fucking thing I think I've ever done. So that's beautiful to be able to do that. You should totally make it an annual thing. That's amazing. And obviously, mm-hmm. like your fans are so dedicated. I'm sure it didn't take that long. Like how long did it take to get to 71K? I think we were pushing for about four days, three or four days. That's insane. That is so Pretty quick. Cool. My God. Um, are you and Nova still planning on living in Los Angeles long term or because in some ways you're kind of in enemy territory even being there and some of the content you make like <laughs> I can't imagine it's like the best place. No, we're actually like, I mean, even, even as of now, we're like, we're, we're way outside of uh, Los Angeles, but we're but we're still in um, California. Um, but yeah, we're like, uh, I mean, we've been looking at lots of places. We've been looking at Texas. Um, we're looking all over the place. And uh, I mean, even like yourself, like you're in Texas now. Right. And, yeah. and, and you, you've had such an incredible time there. And I know I a vouch. lot of people. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people sort of like this year, there was like a mass evacuation out of California and everybody just sort of dispersed <laughs> to, uh, to Texas and places like that. So, um, so, you know, part of me really enjoys being behind enemy lines to be completely honest, but, uh, there is but, something but to we're... that. There is something to that. I felt a similar way when I lived there. Like it felt like, I don't know, I was a, I don't know, like Secret FBI agent, agent or, something. or something, but not FBI, but you know what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, so we're, 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 we're looking into taking off. I don't know where we're going to go yet. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, 2020 did it for me in LA. Like I could not deal with it. It was, 
it, it was insane. I feel like I heard Dude, some like, like insane story from you about 2020. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to tell you like, um, like, oh, dude. So like Nova has like some really like, it's well documented at this point, but she has some like really acute like respiratory stuff. Yeah. So when, um, I don't want to say any words that are going to get you like, It'd be fine. This video. Add okay, so when, on here, we're fine. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so when COVID first came around, like that was like a big thing for Nova, because like, um, like I said, when we incurred that like thirty thousand dollar hospital bill, that was literally like one day she was like, "I have the sniffles," and I was like, "Oh, you probably got a cold or something. Like you'll be fine." And then three days later, like both of her lungs had popped and partially collapsed and were like in the God. hospital and they're like talking about drilling holes and sticking tubes into her rib cage. Cause yo, this is crazy. When her lungs popped, the air escaped into her chest cavity and then started going up into her neck, which closed her esophagus from the pressure of the air bubbles in her neck. If you walked up and squeezed her arm, it felt like rice krispies. You could hear it snapping like the, like the air in her skin, like it was gnarly. I've never even heard of that. Yeah, it was called, it was double anemal thorax. It's it usually happens to uh, scuba divers who go really deep in the ocean and then return to the surface too fast. The air in their lungs expands and pops their, their lungs. So the doctors at the hospital were literally like, we've never in the history of this hospital, we've never encountered anybody that this, this, this had happened to. Wow. So yeah, it was dicey. So, you know, you know, I, I've had to, I've had to carry her in my arms to the sidewalk and lay her on the ground when ambulances show up to put breathing apparatuses on her face. Dude, that's shit. Like, traumatizing. Like, Holy. Yeah. It's gnarly. So when COVID happened, it was like, Oh fuck. Like for Nova, mm. that's like, that's a no go. Mm -hmm. Like, so we're dealing with sort of like the stress of that. And, um, um, during that whole thing, the George Floyd fucking thing happened. And, um, I had, we were living on Melrose at the time. So I had, uh, like a jacket or something at the tailor down at one end of Melrose. And I see the George Floyd thing on the news. And I can see that it's going to be like a fucking problem. Um, and I said to Nova and like this at the same time where like grocery stores are like running out of food and yeah. shit. So I said to Nova one day, I was like, okay. Um, I was still smoking at the time too, uh, which I've, which I've quit. Nice. Um, so uh, we wake up one morning and I'm like, we see the George Floyd thing. I said, okay, look, this is what we got to do. We got to go to the store and get a bunch of cigarettes. And we got to go to the, uh, the the grocery store and get food. And I got to go to the tailor and get this jacket that's been sitting there for a month. And I organized things in order of importance. So food came first, cigarette second, get my jacket third. We go, we go, we go get all the shit, hit Melrose to go to the tailor. And by the time I get to Melrose, like, it's a fucking madhouse. Melrose like, was bad. It was wild. Like there was people everywhere with signs and t-shirts and all this shit. And I was like, oh fuck. And I'm like literally like less than a block off Melrose, my house at the time. So I go get my jacket, go back to the house and pretty much watch the news for the rest of the day. And you know, within four or five hours, like Melrose is fucking burning down. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's half a block from my house and I was like, I was hearing explosions and shit outside. So I walked outside the house, walked down onto the street and kind of just peeked down the street. And there's like a cop car on fire and there's concussion grenades going off. Boom, 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 boom. And there's like all these people running. I can see fire and smoke and all this shit. And there's people running down the street, like towards my house. So I go inside lock all the doors. And I told Nova, I said, get good, you know, get some denim pants on, get a jean jacket on, get a hoodie. Wow. Uh, like, you know, like, you know, at that point in time, like, um, the only the only protection we had in the house back then was like a punch of machetes and baseball bats and shit. 
So like I had like Nova standing in the living room with a baseball bat. I'm standing there with a machete. We're all got our like post-apocalyptic fucking denim outfits on just in case shit hits the fan. And there's people running up my street with arms full of Nike boxes and people jumping my fence and hiding in the bushes in my yard while the cops are racing up and down the street. And I was just like, you know, there's 40 strangers 10 feet away in my fucking front yard. There's Nike shoes all over the fucking ground that people have stolen and looted. Um, there's cop cars on fire, there's explosions going off. And I'm just waiting for somebody to kick the fucking door in, you know, like it right. was fucking, it was intense. Like it was really, really, really intense. That's why it was like for the longest time when people were saying like, Oh, all these like BLM, uh, peaceful protests and shit. I was just like, man, fuck you. It's such a lie. Like, and there's such a unique such experience to living in LA, New York, Portland, Chicago. Um, it's such a unique experience living in those cities versus like, I think people don't understand and it's much easier to believe these groups were peaceful. If you live in like, I don't know, like a small town in Indiana or Northern California or something, it's was very different being yeah. in it. It's it, it, the, the, the contrast between what was being shown on the news and what it was like in real life. Yeah. The, the, the contrast was so fucking stark. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't fucking believe it because they didn't say any, like the next day it was like, oh yeah, like, you know, a couple of people like lit some garbage cans on fire and, 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 but besides that, it was pretty peaceful. And it was just like, yo, like <laughs> I, I lived in that, in the epicenter of that. Like I saw what that was like. I had people hiding in my yard. I had stolen goods all over my fucking, all over in front of my house. Like, I don't know. It was just really fucked up. So insane. yeah, I, you know, like, and that was the point. It, it was at that point where I was like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Like, we just got to get the fuck out of here. Like, to live oh. through that is honestly traumatizing. Like, sometimes I wonder, like, sometimes I talk about summer 2020 and I feel like maybe I'm being dramatic or something because some people just don't get it, especially I live in Austin now and it was never bad here. People are like, oh, that sounds bad. I'm like, no, you don't get it. I lived off of Hollywood Boulevard. It was the most traumatizing thing ever. Uh, well, listen, we got to wrap this up. So I want to ask one more question. What do you mm -hmm. want your legacy to be, Tom? When all is said and done, when it's all a wrap, when you've released everything that you will have released, how do you want to be remembered? Um, I just hope people um, look at me as somebody who um, I was always one of the people. I fought for the people. I'm somebody who never fucking took no for an answer. Um, I didn't give a shit about what the popular narrative was or what the rules were or what was acceptable or any of that nonsense. Um, I hope that people just look at me and think, um, yo, that, that's, a, that's a dude who he never gave up, he never quit, and he was unapologetically himself for his entire time in the spotlight. And, um, and, I, and I hope that they say that I empowered um, – many many people to, to 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 be the same way well listen in my view you're already doing all that so i think you're golden thank you so much for coming on tom thanks blair yeah of course see you soon all right bye, bye.